everyone. Welcome to the Virtual Science Cafe, brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I am your host tonight. My name is Chris. I'm curator for the Daily Planet Theater at the museum in beautiful downtown Raleigh. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being here, being a part of our program. Let me know if this is your first virtual science cafe that you're tuning into. Uh, we've got a really interesting topic tonight, so I'm curious who's jumping into the show for the first time this week to learn a little bit more about gardening and landscaping nature's way. That's right. We're going to talk a little bit about landscaping with nature using natives in your landscape. Now, me personally, uh, I have a nice tidy yard out here, plenty of grass that I absolutely hate to mow. It's awful, especially now that we're moving closer and closer to summer and I have to mow all this grass in the hot summer sun. Mm -mm. I would much rather be able to look out my window and see a bunch of beautiful native plants, flowers, shrubs, and trees that do great on our landscape anyway because they're supposed to be here much nicer, at least in my humble opinion, than all of this green grass. So I'm excited to learn about native gardening, native landscaping. Tonight we've got three very special guests who are joining us from the North Carolina Sea Grant and North Carolina Water Resources Research Institute. First up, I'd like for you to meet Gloria Putnam. Gloria is the Coastal Resources and Communities Specialist for North Carolina Sea Grant. Gloria, welcome. Thank you, Chris. It's very good to be here and be connected with everybody online. So glad that you could join us. How are things in uh, your part of North Carolina? Uh, they're pretty great. We had a nice rain today, watered all our plants, and then the sun came, sun came out and had a nice walk. Excellent. Sounds great. Next up, everybody, I'd like for you to meet Jane Harrison. Jane is the Coastal Economics Specialist for North Carolina Sea Grant. Jane, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris. Hey, y'all. Nice to see you. Glad to be here tonight. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. How are things on uh, your side? Yeah, not bad. Yeah, like Gloria said, the rain was good for the plants. I also like the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely enjoyed going out for that uh, late afternoon walk once it warmed up a little bit, too. All right. And lastly, certainly not leastly, everybody meet Christy Perrin. Christy is the Sustainable Waters and Communities Coordinator for North Carolina Water Resources Research Institute. Hi, Christy. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Doing good. Glad to be here, at least virtually, with the Science Cafe. It's such a great show to host, and we have a great audience. So uh, I think they're probably excited to learn from you. So, folks, the way that the, the show works tonight is our three guests are going to chat with you about their work, the things that they're interested in, the things that they're passionate about. We'll get some tips, tricks, and insight from them, from our experts. As the show goes on, you can leave your questions, comments over in the chat box if you're watching on YouTube or in the comments section if you're watching on Facebook. And as the show goes, we'll be taking note of those. Once the presentation is over, we'll deliver those questions to our guest speakers and see what they think about what you're thinking about. That's how the Science Cafe goes. I will say, since you know this is the internet, uh, over there in those chat boxes, please be respectful. Come on now, be nice, be civil uh, to one another and to our guests. All right, I'm ready to learn. I hope you're ready to learn. So I'm going to turn the show over to our very special guests from the North Carolina Sea Grant and Water Resources Research Institute out of North Carolina State University. Gloria, you're up. Thank you, Chris. I'm gonna get the PowerPoint up here real quick and I'll be ready to go. And Perfect. I, yeah, I think we're ready. So as we've been staying at home during this pandemic, uh, I think we're becoming acutely aware of the value of our social and economic communities. And as we spend more time in our yards, uh, we're becoming more aware of the value of our ecological communities. It also seems that uh, we're realizing that the choices that we make 
however small they may sometimes be, are actually very important. So keeping those things in mind tonight, we're here to share with you some information from the Coastal Landscapes Initiative to help you with your landscaping choices. The Coastal Landscapes Initiative, or what we refer to it as the CLI, is a collaborative effort, is coordinated by North Carolina Sea Grant, but it's dependent on expertise from a diverse set of partners in academia, state agencies, nonprofits, and the horticulture industry. You can find a full list of our partners on our webpage, which we're gonna share with you later. But our work is really driven by primarily one question, and that is how can we increase nature enhancing landscaping in coastal communities with easy or relatively easy, available, affordable, and attractive solutions. Tonight, I'm gonna to start off the presentation by sharing some uh, coastal landscaping challenges and designs that we face. And then Jane and Christy are gonna follow up with some more specific practices for you to consider. But first, what I wanna do is transport you to a beautiful saltwater tidal creek that's located in Carteret County. You may know tidal creeks are, and their watersheds are very dynamic and they're environmentally rich systems that are vital to our state's economy and to our culture. Now, and looking in the photo, you're actually looking at the mouth of the creek as it dumps out into Boat Sound, which runs horizontal on your screen. Past that, you'll see a real small sliver of land and that's Bogue Sound, Bogue Banks, and beyond that is the Atlantic Ocean. I'm gonna take you to the South Bank now, which is on the right side of your screen. And I'm gonna bring your attention to the property that's outlined in the yellow triangle there, rectangle. Gotta get my uh, shape straight. But this property belongs to Francis. Um, Francis has had this property for over 30 years. It's really a vacation spot for her. She actually lives in the Piedmont um, and she knows how to garden in the Piedmont, but she's had a tough time figuring out how to landscape this coastal property. The neighborhood, as you can see, um, is experiencing some growth and some change, just like a lot of uh, North Carolina's coast is, um, especially in the last five years. Um, part of the watershed is still forested, but if you can look over here, hopefully my, hopefully my little cursor is working for you. You can see here, that um, there is new development going on. And as each house comes down, or each, each, each house goes up, more vegetation comes down. So I'm gonna reorient you again. We're gonna be looking up the creek from this angle down at Francis's property. So now what we have is the creek to the right, the road to the left, and Francis's house is the one with the blue tarp on it. This was taken not long after Hurricane Florence. So Frances has seen a lot of uh, changes uh, with growth, but she's also saying that, uh, or, or noticed that in spring tides, uh, sometimes they're called king tides or high, high tides. That's when we have the highest tides of uh, throughout the year. That's when the earth and the sun and the moon are uh, aligned when the earth, when the moon is closest to the earth. The tides are coming up past her bulkhead that you see right on the shoreline. My cursor likes to get lost right here on the shoreline. It's coming up all the way about to that red line. She's also seeing that the groundwater seems to be higher because the ground is always saturated over in this part of her property. On the road side of her property, the, it's a little bit drier, but the wind is always blowing out here. All of these things uh, present some challenges. In the last five years, her, Francis has seen about three hurricanes and she's lost several trees from wind and flooding, just like her neighbors, as you can see along that stretch there. She really misses these trees because they're a home to Ibis. She used to see them there, but now Ibis are down, down at Bill's house. He lives further up the creek. And in this photo here on the left, you can see this is Bill's property. It has a nice mix of uh, bushes and native trees that go all the way down to the water line. And if you look to the right, that's the ibis that I mentioned. Like humans, these are very social creatures and they like to, uh, and they forage in the shallow waters of the marshes there. Bill also says that he sees painted bunting, which arguably is the most colorful bird that we have in North Carolina. Painted buntings uh, nest in scrubby, scrubby shrub areas that are within one mile of salt water. And these are the areas that humans also wanna live and we also, 
want to have our water views, that often means that we don't have these scrubby, shrubby areas anymore. Uh, painted bunting feed on weed and grass seeds for most of the year, and then during breeding season, they switch to insects. So Frances is interested in adding plants to her property that'll support these and other birds, and will also be attractive, and salsa will uh, survive these very harsh coastal conditions that I've talked about. So to help Francis and others that have similar interests, and there are people that have similar interests, the Coastal Landscapes Initiative partnered and uh, created 10 landscaping design templates using coastal native plants. The Department of Landscape Architecture at NC State University provided the design expertise to accomplish the task. And other partners, including the conservation horticulturists at the North Carolina Aquariums and owners of Habitats Gardens, provided uh, important uh, plant expertise for us. One other resource that we used for the templates was this uh, coastal landscaping guide. This is also produced by the Coastal Landscapes Initiative. It features 34 native plants that range from trees, shrubs, and grasses to vines and flowers. Uh, it includes brief descriptions about each plant and information on the coastal conditions that each plant is actually most suitable for. So the guide is actually in a booklet and a brochure form. You can find these on our webpage, which is down at the bottom. And Christy, I think is gonna have it on her last slide because you don't get it now. Um, you can also contact us and ask for hard copies of the booklet. This is one of the 10 design templates. This is some of the content that's in it. Um, each design is intended to help define edges and organize spaces in your yard. Um, they also would work well as a standalone gardens, but each design is specific for uh, the soil moisture and sun conditions. You always need to, when you're thinking about landscaping your property, look and see what your conditions are first, then decide what you're going to plant. Um, each template measures like five by 20 feet, and you can modify them for your specific lot configurations. There's a lot of information on here, including, you know, type and placement of the plants. And we also, not on this slide, are alternative plant suggestions and maintenance tips, maintenance tips for you. This particular template is designed for privacy screening or to block out an unsightly view. It's a semi-evergreen tree border. Uh, when the trees are young, the plants that are below it, goldenrod and orange coneflower, will bloom throughout the spring, summer, and fall and attract pollinators and other beneficial insects. And in the winter and fall, in the fall and the winter, birds can forage on the flower seeds. To give me an idea, just quickly, um, on my last slide, of how Frances is going to use these templates on her on her property. Uh, again, on the right is the tidal creek. On the left is the road, and her house is right in the middle. She plans on uh, using the shoreline border close to her water, which makes sense. So plants that prefer moist soil that tolerate occasional flooding and that can um, are tolerant also of salt air. She's also going to install an evergreen border. Um, that close to the water that's short enough to not block her water view or her neighbor's water view. By the road, she's going to plant a bird friendly border. She has some existing dogwoods, but she's going to be able to work this border in between that to provide some privacy between her home and the new development. She's going to install a pollinator friendly border, a foundation plant, and also a, a, a screen that is composed of vines. So in the end, she's going to have the yard that um, that she's always wanted and that's going to provide a lot of habitat for the uh, for the for the wildlife in the area. We hope that you are also interested in using these templates and sharing these templates templates with people that you know around the coast. And many of these are also uh, applicable here in the Piedmont. And if you want them, they'll be on our website. They're not there now. Expect them to be there within two and a half, three weeks. Please visit to find them, or you can email us and uh, to be put on a list for when they are posted. So with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Jane to tell you about some nature-inspired landscaping that you can use on your home. Great. Thanks, Gloria. I'm really excited to see what happens here in Francis's yard. I can't wait to visit 
um, when the stay at home order is over and it's safe to travel. Um, if you can uh, take it to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to uh, do with you all tonight is just share some of the tips, some of the things that, um, you know, Frances is thinking about as she is shifting her yard over and things that you can think about for your own yard and whether you're on the coast or, you know, a little bit more inland, um, these tips should generally hold true. Um, so as Chris alluded, choose native plants when you can, and you really want to choose natives that are well suited to your conditions. So to the coastal conditions, for example, for Francis. Um, seashore mallow is one of those plants. Um, and that's something that I believe Francis is actually gonna be uh, growing in her yard now. Um, and you may have seen this perennial, you know, it can be found in brackish marshes, even freshwater marshes. And one reason that it's attractive is that it has a very long blooming period so from May until October, it also attracts pollinators. Um, so you might see butterflies coming to it, ruby-throated hummingbirds, which I've never seen but would love to see, um, and even lizards. And so what happens with native plants, you know, the big benefit to them is that our wildlife, wildlife that's native to the state, to the coast, relies on native plants for food and shelter. So plants like the seashore mallow are well adapted to the harsh conditions of the coastal region, for example. And that means they don't require a lot of fertilizer or a lot of watering or really a lot of upkeep. They're meant to be there. And so if you can you know, plant shrubs and trees that are native to that coastal environment, they're more likely to withstand the effects of storms because they're resistant to wind and to floods. And when you're thinking about planting different kinds of natives, remember, you know, different heights, um, you know, different blooming times, you want to see those flowers all year round, or at least I do. And that also benefits our plant and animal communities. And if you're thinking about non-native plants, um, there are many that are also well suited to the coastal region, as well as more inland. Just make sure that you do not encourage or plant invasive species. So there are a lot of non-natives that are well suited, um, but again, just think about, you know, if there's a species that's going to threaten your native plant communities, that's one you want to avoid. So avoid some of those invasives like Chinese privet or English ivy. Wildlife depends on having these native plants in the ecosystem and these invasives can really prevent that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is quiz time for you all. Chris is gonna help me a little bit here. Um, if you could just write in your chat there on YouTube, if you know the answer or think you have the answer, which is the native tree? I just wanna test your all's knowledge. So Loblolly Bay or Mimosa, which is the native tree to North Carolina? Um, and generally, which one is found in the coastal region of North Carolina? Loblolly Bay or Mimosa? Gloria, if you could move to the next slide. All right, now which is the native bush? I'm gonna get back to these answers in a moment. So what do you think? Thorny olive or Yopon holly? Which is the native bush to the state of North Carolina and which do you often find, would you find native to the coastal region of the state? All right, one more quiz question, next slide. All right, what about the native vine? So is it the Japanese honeysuckle or the coral honeysuckle? What are you likely to find on the coast here in the state? What are you likely to find just in the state generally in terms of what would be native to this area? All right, Gloria, you wanna go back to our tree question? I'm just gonna quiz uh, Chris real quick. So Chris, I don't know if you're a big native guy or you know, it sounds like you might have some turf you're dealing with at your house, um, but what do you think here? Which is the native tree? Do you have any clue? Oh, I know this one. <laughs> I know this one for the reason uh, that as a college student, I had the task one summer of working to get rid of some of these uh, non-native invasive species. So I know those beautiful pink flowers anywhere because I had to chop down countless mimosas. I do believe the correct answer here is the Loblolly Bay. You are correct. 
and yeah. I'm uh, I'm looking at our at our YouTube viewers too. I want to see who got it here. Uh, Angel, Carol, Nature Out Loud, Kennedy, they all got it right. Lob Lolly Bay. Excellent. All right. Yeah, my guess is that a lot of you knew immediately that mimosa is not native to the coastal region or the state, and yet you're so much more likely to see it in your neighbor's yard or maybe even your own yard. Um, so mimosa is considered an invasive in the southeast, and it commonly advances from the garden to natural habitats. What it does is it produces shoots from root sprouts, and which allows it to form these really dense thickets, and then it prevents native plants from growing. Alternatives that you may want to consider are the native red buckeye and the eastern red bud. Um, now, the Lob Lolly Bay, you may not really be familiar with it in terms of landscaping or what you're going to see in your own yard. Um, it's really a you know, flowering, broadleaf tree, evergreen, that's common in your Focosin or wetland bogs in the state. Um, you might find it in a swamp forest or a wet pine savanna. And it's very important to Carolina Bay wetland ecosystems. Um, so these are very special places. And I don't know if you all have visited one before. Um, they're actually a unique geological formation that has an elliptical shape. And they're often seen in Eastern North Carolina. And so what the Loblolly Bay does is it provides cover to wildlife during winter and extreme weather. Okay, let's go to the next uh, slide here. All right, let's get back to this bush. So Chris, what are you seeing from uh, YouTube chat? Did anyone come up with the right answer here? Uh, they're not too sure about this one. Or individually, I think they are somewhat certain, but we got varying answers. Uh, so right. we got, it's like 50-50, <laughs> Olive versus Holly. No, oh, all right. What about you? What do you think, Chris? Ooh, I, I know that North Carolina has native Ilex. So we do have native hollies. Um, my guess would be the holly. All right, you got it, nice job. So thorny olive is an invasive. This is a shrub that's spread by bird dispersed seeds. And an alternative that I would suggest to the thorny olive is this Yapon holly. Um, another alternative that you might wanna consider is the high bush blueberry. And then you're also gonna get that fruit so you can make some jam. Um, Yopan holly is really an evergreen shrub, or you might see it as a small tree, and it's native to our sandy woods in the state. Um, you might find it in brackish and tidal marsh shorelines, dunes, maritime forests, um, as well as shrub thickets. And so it has these really cool, you know, white fragrant flowers that then give way to red berries that actually provide sustenance to our native songbirds and small mammals. All right, final quiz here, next slide. Okay, Chris, what are you hearing out from the audience? Do folks know what the native vine is? This might be a, a little bit of an easy one. <laughs> so let's see, the YouTube chat is unanimous in coral honeysuckle. All right, good job y'all, you did great. Yes, so Japanese honeysuckle is the common invasive plant in the Southeast. I see it in my yard, unfortunately. I was just cutting it back the other day. I didn't plant it there, but it comes over the fence. I'm not sure from where, I'm not gonna blame any neighbors, but it does a really good job of spreading itself. Um, what it does is it colonizes by prolific vine growth and then seeds are dispersed by birds. And so again, this is a plant that forms those evergreen mats which shade out native vegetation and then it climbs up your small trees and your shrubs. Um, so a great alternative to the Japanese honeysuckle, once you cut it back, and you may have to do that year after year after year, is the coral honeysuckle. So quarry honeysuckle, Carolina jessamine, crossvine, those are all great alternatives here. Um, what I like about the coral honeysuckle is um, a couple things. One, you're gonna see a lot of different birds that will come to it. So songbirds like cedar wax wings, catbirds, cardinals, they all like to feed on its berries. Um, it's also a larval host to the hummingbird clear wing moth. Um, and then you might also see some hummingbirds. I mean, just look at the shape of that flower. I think that's perfect for a hummingbird. Um, all right, next slide. All right, I'm gonna give you a few more tips here for your own yards. Um, one tip that I have, and um, it's something that, uh, 
I certainly have around my own yard is a lot of different mixes of types of plants. So when I say different plant types, I'm talking about trees, shrubs, grasses, vines, flowering perennials. And so what that ends up producing is a varied vegetation structure. So you're gonna see ground cover, you're gonna see medium trees, tall trees. And what's really cool about all these different varieties is that it's gonna provide a lot of different kinds of habitat for different kinds of animals, birds, and insects that might control your plant pests. Um, and it also improves the quality of your groundwater and your surface water. Next slide. Okay, so this is another tip. Um, if you can, and this goes to you, Chris, uh, as well, reduce the turf. Think about your lawn alternatives. So these are three great examples and they're so beautiful. Um, so what happens with a lawn is that you've got usually one non-native species of turf grass, which doesn't do a lot for wildlife. So let's think about these other examples. Ferns, for instance, they provide foraging space, and shelter for ground feeding birds, while other critters like frogs and turtles like to hide in them. Ferns are especially appropriate for shady spots, as is wild ginger. Um, now, if you have a great sunny spot in your yard, you could go with flowering perennials that come back year after year after year. Now, if you have um, a native grass like pink moly grass, that's another great option. You can also reduce your lawn simply by expanding the mulch around your trees and your flower beds. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so reduce your water and fertilizer use if you can. So this is really another step towards sustainable landscaping. So when you are watering, think about doing it strategically. Try to water early in the morning so it doesn't evaporate as quickly. Also, avoid light, frequent watering. Strong and healthy plants, they have deep roots, which requires deep watering. There's no real hard and fast definition for what it means to water deeply, but basically think about the water being able to soak, say, maybe eight inches below the soil's surface. And what you want to think about is the plant's roots. They're not sitting, you know, up at the top there of the surface. They're actually down below. They're working their way into the soil in search of nutrients and water. So you can really help your, protect your plant in times of drought um, if you're going to water more deeply because the soil surface is actually going to dry out a lot more quickly than it will below ground where the soil is much uh, cooler. Okay, next slide. Now this is one of my favorite tips. Um, I'm a tree person uh, and you know, when I see people cutting down trees, I have to say my heart hurts a little bit. <laughs> so a lot of folks, you know, they do think about cutting down trees because of storms. We see that on the coast. We also see that further inland. My neighbors, for example, just cut down every tree in their yard last year. Um, just in, in, in anticipation of storms. Um, and so what I would suggest if you're concerned about trees falling around your house is to choose storm ready trees. So get to know the tree species that are gonna do best during a storm event. And I've got a picture of this book here that is a, just a great resource to get you familiar with which trees those would be. Paul Hozier, he's a uh, professor emeritus at UNC Wilmington. Um, he's a plant guru, especially at coastal plants. And so this book, chapter seven, they have a whole um, section on native vegetation and coastal storms, so what to plant. Um, and so here are some of the highlights or the ideas to think about. First, regardless of the species, trees growing together typically have an advantage. So if you have a tree, you know, trees with interlacing root systems, they're much less likely to be uprooted than a single specimen. Also, trees growing in clumps, so, you know, not a single line, they're actually going to be able to shield one another. This, are in, this particular arrangement enhances their survival. And then if you have a clump composed of a mixture of, of species, they can actually do better um, during powerful winds than just a single species in the same clump. 
You also want to consider physical tree characteristics. So height, crown shape, trunk shape, wood density, those all affect their resilience. And remember, no matter what, always inspect your trees for damage or disease. If you can maintain your tree's health ahead of the storm, you're much less likely to have storm damage. So if you want to know more about this, um, you can also check out this article. It's at the link there on the bottom of the screen, go.ncsu.edu forward slash hardy trees. Um, that's got some of the basic tips there. And if you're kind of wondering well, which trees are these, um, here's a photo of one, the live oak. Um, one of the reasons that it's recommended is because you know, it has a somewhat low profile. It also has deep roots when it's in well-drained soil. A few other trees to consider, especially if you're further inland, maybe live oak isn't as common, say in the Piedmont. Um, think about using flowering dogwood. Um, common persimmon is another great example. Plus you get the fruit, um, as well as American holly, which happens to have high wind resistance. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this gets into my final tip. So this is really for waterfront property owners. Um, I want you all to consider when possible nature enhancing alternatives if you're able to replace deteriorating bulkheads. So these bulkheads, these kind of, you know, more structured, um, uh, you know, setups right next to your property line between the water and land, you know, they have a shelf life. And so when their time is up, why not consider a living shoreline? And so really, you know, there's a lot of environmentally friendly options that are out there. And the research shows that living shorelines are actually able to outperform hard engineered shoreline stabilization structures during storms. And they're also a lower cost to repair. Um, so it's really a, a great alternative to consider. This particular picture was a property I visited in Elizabeth City, and this property floods all the time on the right. Um, and so they're thinking, okay, what can I do? Um, and so the cool thing, if you're going to install a living shoreline, what you can kind of think about, you know, one of the benefits is that it connects these upland, the intertidal, as well as the aquatic areas, while also providing shoreline erosion control. Uh, next slide. So what am I talking about? This is what that living shoreline could look like. These are volunteers that are actually um, uh, putting one together in Moorhead City. And so basically this is just an area along the waterfront that's full of thriving vegetation. This particular um, shoreline, they're using oyster shells. Um, so this native material, it provides shoreline erosion control. And then they've got the grasses in the background that offer these ecological benefits. So having that kind of coastal salt marsh habitat provides uh, you know, protection for fish, for crustaceans. Now, I know some people who have looked into living shorelines in the past, they found that it's been a little bit of a struggle um, from a regulatory standpoint, but recently they've actually um, made this process much easier. So if you're looking to put a living shoreline on your property, you just need to connect with the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management where you can get that permit. Now, I realize that a lot of our audience doesn't live on the coast. Um, and so I'm going to trade it off to Christy now to talk about things you can do in the Piedmont. Um, Christy, I just would love to hear what are you doing where you live? I know you're in Raleigh. So um, just tell us a little bit. What are you up to in your yard and in your community when it comes to nature inspired landscaping? Well, Jane, here at my house, um, to my partner's delight, I've been replacing turf with um, native plants including that coral honeysuckle, because I'm trying to get some hummingbirds at my house. Um, and in my community, I work a lot with people on protecting our local waterways across North Carolina um, and here in the Piedmont um, Triangle area. Um, so I spend a lot of time thinking about um, how can we keep storm water, which is the rain that falls during a storm, from running off of hard surfaces into our storm drains and then into our creek systems um, where they can cause a lot of problems such as habitat degradation and downstream flooding and pollution. So um, 
the way we manage stormwater or rainfall on our properties is another way to be sustainable in our landscaping. Um, so we used to try and get the rainfall off our properties as fast as possible, like get it off our properties, send it downstream so it's not our problem. Well, then it becomes somebody else's problem. It becomes our wildlife's problems. Um, we certainly know how horrible our flooding has been getting downstream from Raleigh here, sometimes in Raleigh. Um, so it's, it's really important to start thinking about what we do with our rainwater. Um, so the tip here is to try and keep as much of your rainwater on your property as possible and get benefit out of it and get use from that rainwater. And when you do this, you'll conserve water, you'll spend less on your water bill, and you're gonna help reduce problems downstream. Um, so I'm gonna mention a few specific techniques. Um, there are more than I have time for, um, but just for a starter, um, you see here on the left side of the screen, um, a, a citizen of, a resident of Wilmington, North Carolina using a rain barrel. Um, and you can also use much larger rainwater harvesting cisterns to collect water. And these are a great option for people who garden and landscape and have something on their property to water. You can even use it in your edible gardens. Um, another option is to direct the runoff from your rooftop gutters and your downspouts towards a planted area rather than letting it go into a driveway where it then goes into a street and into a storm drain or into a ditch um, where it then flows quickly into our streams and causes those problems downstream. So the picture you see on the right is St. Ambrose Episcopal Church in Southeast Raleigh, and they've redirected their runoff from their rooftop and their parking lot into their prayer garden. So this is a new prayer garden. Um, and it's quite amazing. Um, they also installed two 850 gallon cisterns um, to capture that rooftop runoff and harness that and use it um, in their prayer garden. So I find it truly inspirational. And they also, if you look, look at this picture at the garden to your left, that's immediately next to the parking lot, it's a special type of garden. And uh, Gloria, if you could go to the next slide, please. So I was inspired not only by St. Ambrose's um, garden, but um, by my son's uh, assignment to write haiku this past week. So I, I tried my own hand at haiku. This is my first one. So I'm describing the garden and if you're able to write in the chat box what you think it is. Rain and plants unite, downstream friends get respite, breathe and swim easy. So what kind of garden is this? I'll let you all type, but um, I will tell you um, about this particular garden um, and some of the plants you see here. You can use native plants in this type of garden as well. So not only are you reducing runoff and helping your downstream neighbors, but you're also benefiting from um, providing habitat and having a beautiful garden. Um, so this is a, Chris, what kind of garden is this, do you think? Well, I think I, think I know your haiku is beautiful. Uh, and it looks like the people in our YouTube viewership got the right answer too. They say, and I say, it is a rain garden. And you are right. So it is a rain garden. So rain gardens allow rainwater to soak into the ground um, where it replenishes our groundwater and it, less of it flows quickly into the stream. Um, it holds about six to nine inches of water and uh, then releases it away from your home. And it's designed to soak in that water within two to three days. And that's really important because it takes seven days for mosquito larvae to hatch. So um, it doesn't allow for that to happen. The plants are selected for hardiness and for being able to withstand drought and having temporary wet conditions, which we call wet feet. And this is the Katak Rain Garden. Um, I worked with this homeowner and a number of others 
in um, the Black Creek watershed in the town of Cary. So, and you'll see um, Beautyberry and Black Eyed Susans and um, Inkberry, which do really well in rain gardens. And next slide, please. And I wanna show next a different scale of these types of landscape techniques. Um, recently, I had the good fortune to partner with Principal Sherry Slicer and her staff of students at Kingswood Elementary School, also in Cary in the Black Creek watershed. Um, so we worked with them to design and install a very large rain garden. You can see a student and her parent planting some muley grass in this rain garden and to install a 2,200 gallon rainwater harvesting cistern, which you see on the right. And the art teacher and her students had a lot of fun um, decorating that cistern. Um, so we were able to um, also replace a number of non-native plants um, there was where the cistern was located was a, a large swath of mature um, heavenly bamboo, um, which isn't really heavenly to birds because, um, or it's also called nandina. Um, migrating birds will swoop down and eat the berries and they're toxic. So we got rid of that. We didn't save any of that. And we planted about 80% of the 200 plants um, that we planted were native species. It is hard to do 100% native plants on a site. And it's, you know, even in my home, I certainly don't have that, but we try to get as many as we can. Um, next, next slide, please. And then finally, the last, the last technique for reducing rainfall runoff that I wanna um, talk about is my favorite and it's trees. So leaving healthy trees in the landscape is the most cost-effective way to prevent stormwater runoff. And of course, planting trees is helpful as well. So this tree in this picture right now is my favorite tree. Um, you can see it's my family's favorite tree too. That's my son and his best buddy climbing it. Um, even before I found out how beneficial this tree was for protecting our streams um, and I would, pose again for the chat box, what tree is this? What tree absorbs the most rainwater in the urban Piedmont of North Carolina? Um, so recently some colleagues of mine in the USDA Forest Service here in Raleigh conducted some research on which trees um, have the greatest potential for reducing runoff in urban areas. Um, and Chris, do you wanna take a guess on this one? What tree this is? What? tree absorbs the most rainwater and a native species here in the Piedmont you said yep Ooh, and it looks like the one in that picture uh, yeah in the, fall, in the fall too so that makes it hard huh actually that was spring that was just a few weeks ago before I'm gonna say it's a red bud no but you're close oh. it's a it's a red maple a red maple. So, okay. Yeah. Not oh, only are the chat people in the chat got it right. Awesome. <laughs> Plant some red maples. Um, that's my final advice. Um, if they if they work for your property. Um, so finally, the last um, last of the two slides here. Um, so if you want to learn more about these techniques, um, uh, there is a series or a series of guide books on WRI's website. Um, this, these were done about 10 years ago in, in conjunction in partnership with Ann Spafford with an NCSU Department of Horticulture Science. Um, and we recently, um, WRI recently updated them. Um, so they're um, freshened up and new on our website. So uh, to learn more, you can go there at go.ncsu.edu forward slash rains, rainscaping. And if you go to the next slide, the last slide, and you can also find a link to these and a number of other resources about the topics that Jane and Gloria talked about as well at the Coastal Landscapes Initiative website at go.ncsu.edu forward slash coastal landscapes. Um, and you can also download a copy of the landscaping guide Gloria talked about, as well as design templates in a few weeks. Um, so that's all we have. And I hope that we've sparked some ideas for folks to think about at home. Um, and if there's time, we'd love to hear what, what you're doing in your own yards or what you might be inspired to try based on what you've heard. 
Thank you very much. All three of you, excellent work. Yay. Everybody put your uh, clapping hands emojis in the chat to say thanks for our three guest speakers. Oh, this is great stuff. Uh, I love this topic. Uh, I, I alluded to it at the open of the show, but I have done my very best to get rid of as much turf as I can and get in native plants. And I have to say, my favorite thing about it, doing all of this, it's been a lot of holes to dig, uh, lots of sh sore shoulders and arms and backs through the, the spring and the fall planting seasons. But just going out and seeing the diversity of birds and insects in the yard just skyrocket. You know, even just putting in the first few plants, it was incredible. I mean, I'm someone who, likes to sit outside and look at the birds and walk through the garden and look for the insects. Maybe some folks don't like that so much, but that just is the greatest thing to me. So people have been leaving questions for you. Um, I'm not sure who the best person to take some of these questions would be. So I'll, I'll just let the three of you sort it out, I suppose, but let's jump right into it. Hope you're ready. The first one, comes from Kennedy. Are there any tips for planting natives in pots? They want to help pollinators, but they're renting. Ooh. Shane, you look like you're about to talk, but if... <laughs> well, I, I have done some of that. I mean, I think it's going to depend plant to plant, whether that's going to be a good fit or not. Um, sometimes what I'll do um, is to kind of try a plant out I'll, you know, I might, you know, try a pot and see because, you know, once you put something in the ground, it's a little harder to, to make a change. And sometimes I don't know how, where are they going to do best too. So a pot can be a great way to go. Um, for example, I took um, some climbing aster that I purchased at the Arboretum, um, at the NC State Arboretum. So that's a native. Um, it's really cool because it blooms in October and November, these pretty purple flowers. Um, and, and I have those in pots so that I can move it around. It's a very um, kind of unwieldy plant. So some people think it looks too messy. Um, so I, per I put it in the pots in particular because I was like, I don't know if I'm ready for it to fully take over the spot in my yard. <laughs> I've planted lantana in pots. I used to have a townhouse and I didn't have much space. I planted lantana and I also had that coral um, or trumpet honeysuckle in a big pot. I just had something for it to climb on and it lived forever. <laughs> I left it there when I moved. <laughs> so there's a few options out there. I think the garden stores could help you a little bit. Yeah, and that's one thing I will say is get to know your local garden store. Um, so, you know, try to get away from the big box stores if you can. Um, and if you, you know, ask them what's going to work well in this kind of environment, you know, they will, they will help you out. Excellent. Next one up. This person has, let's see, they wrote that they have a mulberry tree in their backyard. Is there any way to help it produce better berries? Is mulberry actually a native species to North Carolina? I don't know. I'm Googling. I think okay. so. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think that it is. I've got one in my backyard. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't fertilize it though, and it produces a lot of berries. Yes, native mine makes enough berries for me and the birds. Berries. Mine does too. So I don't know, maybe it's a question of if there's enough sun available for it to produce the flowers and then the berries. Okay, okay. <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, let's see. Oh, this one is a comment. Angel said that the templates. Gloria, that you were talking about sounded like really great plans for landscaping. Uh, hopefully one day we can see the finished look. I guess we'll have to have you back. Thanks for that comment, Angel. Okay. Now, Eric is, now Eric's got a good question and one that might apply to a lot of folks. Eric says he has a black thumb. No plant that gets near him survives. What would you recommend as a plant that would look good that he could not kill. 
Um, Black Eyed Susans are one of the hardiest things that I've ever planted. I plant them in every rain garden I do now and I have them in my own yard and I put them in different places in my own yard. Um, they're beautiful, they attract pollinators and sometimes birds. Um, I don't think you can kill them, I don't know. But you need sun, so. Thank you, okay. Ooh, here's a tree I'm question. Sorry, for some reason, and it came back on. I would recommend any type, most grasses are, are easy to keep alive. So something like that. And grasses pink are grass. like pink muley grass, uh, switch grass. There, I think there's a delay. All right, all right. There you go, Eric. Try some grass. Native grass. Not turf grass. <laughs> decorative grass. Native grass. So, non turf grass. <laughs> Find you some North Carolina native grasses. Pink muley grass is one of my favorites. I haven't planted any yet, but I just think it's gorgeous. It gets tall and that nice pink, purpley color. Yeah, you in the fall, that. you really see that color. It's done great in my yard. I haven't had to do a thing for it. It's very happy. Now here's a tree question. Carol's asking, is a leaning tree always a danger? We have some leaning to get sun and they are large. Hmm. My question would be, what's it leaning towards? <laughs> um, so anytime something's leaning towards your house, that's a little you know, scarier than something that's just leaning over your yard. Um, but again, inspect it for good health. And I would suggest having an arborist actually come out and do inspections on some regular basis. Um, you know, maybe you have a friend who's an entomologist. That would be great too. I happen to have uh, my brother as an entomologist. So I'll have him come and check my trees. That might be a special uh, <laughs> treat that I get. Um, but again, you know, check out the health of that tree um, before you decide, you know, is this, is this really a danger? Uh, Gloria or Christy, other thoughts? I always point I to the yeah, I would say the same thing. It's really, I wouldn't say it's a hazard unless it's leaning over something, you know, like a place that you often walk or, or your house. As long as it's not a hazard to a person, you should be okay. And I'll second uh, Jane's comment about an arborist. If you can, if you can afford it, uh, then I recommend you hire an arborist to look after your trees. And if you plant trees, um, Take real good care of them when 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 it's or when they're when they're young, because that's going to save you lots of money in the long run. Uh, for instance, I've had a tree in my backyard. An arborist told me five years ago it was double trunked, and he told me five years ago that I should have taken one of those trunks off. I didn't listen to him. Now it's costing me six hundred fifty dollars to, you know, get that one limb taken back so that it's not so that I don't lose it down, you know, so the windstorm doesn't take it and take it down. And another bit of advice that you always hear from those in the industry um, is just right plant, right place. So if it turns out that tree is in a hazardous location and you've got to get rid of it, put in something that's going to fit better. Um, so whenever you're planting a new tree, especially, think about what is the height, the final height of that tree, not the height when you plant it. Um, so many people go wrong, you know, going to the garden store and saying, I like the look of it right now um, versus thinking about what will this look in 10, 15 or 20 years. Excellent advice. Uh, now, Carol's also got a good question here. Where can people get native plants right now? We're in kind of an interesting time, aren't we? Hmm. Well, after May 8th, the stay-at-home order is, is uh, changing at least. Um, I don't know which garden stores will be open at that time. Um, you know, there has been a big push, I think, for folks to go to the Home Depots and the Lowe's and it presents a little bit of a safety issue at this time. Um, if you can call and get some curbside service at your local garden store, that would be the best. You know, tell them what you want. They can probably set it up 
you know, set them out for you ahead of time. You could maybe pay with your credit card or whatever over the phone. That would be the safest way to go. And again, to support those local businesses that often have a bigger supply of native plants than the box stores do. That's right, Jane. And uh, there are also online sources. So you could go on, you know, go and check them out. One of our, uh, one of our coastal landscapes, coastal landscaping initiative groups is working to develop a list of uh, nurseries along the coast that provide native plants. And we're getting that for the entire coast. And uh, actually, I think that the List is kind of lived with the North Carolina Coastal Federation, but it'll be linked from our website in the future as well. But call you, I think the uh, curbside, some nurseries are doing curbside, just you know, give a call to a few nurseries in the area. And it's a good thing, the more that we have people asking for native plants, the greater the supply is going to become. And that's one of the dilemmas that we're facing right now is that it's difficult sometimes to find the supply. So one thing about the native plant book and the templates, try to use plants that are somewhat readily available. I've got more great questions for you. Uh, let's see, Angel Matthews. My daughter asked, if we plant a maple tree, how long does it take to get that big so I can climb in it? <laughs> That's a great question. My partner planted that tree after he, uh, built this house i think it's 15 years old okay okay <laughs> so plant it now yeah is the answer right plant it yesterday <laughs> uh, let's see here oh ann's got a good question do people in raleigh grow pawpaws hmm. Well, I love pawpaws. I just have to say that. I've been to the pawpaw festival in southeastern Ohio. Um, I don't know if anyone else has been there. Um, I hope they have one in North Carolina. Often you see pawpaws a little bit more in a kind of hilly forested area. I know they do well just naturally in a forested environment. And I think they're a little bit hard to cultivate. Um, Gloria, Christy, thoughts on pawpaw? I've never planted I one. Have never eaten pawpaw. I've never eaten pawpaw, but I do have two pawpaw trees in my yard that are growing slowly. In fact, a couple of them got nicked in a storm we had a few weeks ago when a tree came down because, you know, I didn't call an arborist early enough to take <laughs> care of that tree. Do you say you but get I will say you need, you need two different species. You need two different, well, you need two different plants. Um, Two different, two different trees. A male and a female. The same plant. And you need to make sure that they have a lot of shade when they're young. I killed my first one because I didn't give it enough water and I didn't give it enough shade. So make sure it has some shade uh, early on. And then you can watch your paw paw patch grow. <laughs> yeah, that might be why I've seen them mostly in the forest. They like that shade. Christine. Excellent, excellent. Uh, let's see, Dale's asking if there's a list of native plant nurseries in the triangle that's available. Gloria, you mentioned that uh, there was a group putting together one for the coast, but there Christy, is. since would, you're here local. Yeah, I would suggest going to the Native Plant Societies, on the North Carolina Native Plant Societies webpage. They have a, they have a good list of uh, nurseries and it, and it ranges throughout the state. Yeah, that'd be mine. I know there are some um, in Chatham County. Um, you know, being a state employee, I probably can't recommend one over the other. But so I think the advice of going to the Native Plant Society site is a great one. It looks like some folks in the chat box are helping out with that question. Oh, perfect. I'll, I'll leave it to our science and nature enthusiastic community for that one. Uh, let me see here. Now, out in, this is a question that I've got. Out in my yard, I have lots of milkweed, right? Everybody likes to get the monarch butterflies in the yard. So we planted a bunch of milkweed, but I also mulched because I don't like to pull weeds. And I heard that 
with a lot of our native plants, mulching the garden actually wasn't a good thing to do. So should I mulch to keep out that turf? Should I try not to? I don't know what to do. Well, I would suggest, yeah. So I've had the same experience with trying, uh, with planting native plants, expecting them to spread, and then they didn't because I mulched it too heavily. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is that you want them to reseed. The mulch is a good, it, it, it's great for keeping out plants, period. Whether, whether they're native plants or whether it's grass. The, if you mulch, it's a good idea to sort of thin it out around the plants in the fall, allow the seeds to fall and hopefully come up in the spring. Just make sure you don't mulch it too heavily. That would be my advice. Got you, got you. Hopefully I can get some more, some more milkweed growing in the yard. You can come get some from my house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the next worry, right? I'll do a good job and then uh, some of these natives will take over. Although I do have to say that uh, I was outside today and my one patch of milkweed, which is about, I have as much milkweed as would fit on a dinner plate, had 10 monarch butterfly caterpillars climbing on it. Already, wow. Already, and all different wow. sizes. So I'm, I don't know how they found these little green stems sticking up out of my yard, but they did, and I'm thrilled about it. Can't wait. Huh. I hope they make it. There's also lots of birds around here. Mm -hmm. Oh, Glenn left a great comment. The Museum of Natural Sciences at our Prairie Ridge Eco Station, which unfortunately is closed right now. You can't go visit it, but he's saying uh, Prairie Ridge does have several pawpaw trees growing. And the Museum of Natural Sciences downtown Raleigh could also be a great resource if you're in the area or visiting one day. Just walk up and down the sidewalk in front of the museum. A lot of that area right in front of our building on Jones Street is planted with North Carolina natives. So you just walk up the street, you know, and write them down, which you see on the nameplates as you go. And, uh, and then visit the museum inside once we reopen and you can get even more information about uh, the plants and animals that we have right here in our state. Oh, you know what? I'm going to take this question too. Carol's got a really good one. A very good question. Any suggestions for good deer resistant plants? Specifically in the Piedmont, but this probably applies to everyone everywhere in the Eastern US. Hey y'all, I just have to say I have to run. I apologize. I have a very important city council meeting I've got to attend. It's another Zoom and it uh, pertains to some safety issues in the green way. Um, but it was so great to be with you all. And I think Gloria and Christy can finish up the, the great conversation here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you for being a part of our conversation. Um, I, I was just trying to rack my mind for um, the deer resistant plants that I've planted in rain gardens. And I'm just, I'm just going blank right now. I know there's some. <laughs> Um, there are, I, one of the resources on the CLI webpage, which will be useful for anyone is the North Carolina Cooperative Extension. I think it's the plant database, Gloria, is that what it's called? Yes. I think they have filters you can use to filter for different, um, characteristics for plants. And I think deer resistance might be one of them, if I remember correctly. So that's a good resource to that database to look at um, when you're trying to find the right plant for the right place and that deer won't eat. <laughs> I have problems with rabbits in my yard. So if you find some that rabbits don't eat, I'd be, I'd be very happy. <laughs> Christy, I would refer them to the same location. Deer come in my yard, but they just browse whatever they want. I'm not really good about planting things they don't like. All right. Well, everybody, I think that is our time for tonight. Everybody give our guests one more big round of applause. Wherever you happen to be watching from, let's hear it. I'm sure they can hear it from wherever you're at too. 
Uh, Gloria Christie, thank you so much for being a part of our Virtual Science Cafe series. Thank you, Chris. It's been fun. Yeah. Thanks for enlightening us all. And I look forward to seeing uh, more. I want everybody to check out North Carolina Sea Grant. Send Sea Grant your nature haikus. Send us at the museum your nature haikus. We want to see them too. Uh, if you've got great native landscaping going on or you're just getting started, let us know about it. We want to hear about ways that you are getting excited about the nature that's right in your backyard and right in your community. That's what we're all about at the museum as well. So many thanks to North Carolina Sea Grant, Water Resources Research Institute, and our guests from the Coastal Landscapes Initiative tonight. Everybody, make sure that you follow the museum on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're at Natural Sciences. And be sure to check out naturalsciences.org. There you can access our Science at Home page, and we update that site daily with new activities, videos, all kinds of great science and nature related stuff that I know you would like. That's where you can also find out what the next programs coming up are going to be. We'll be back here next Thursday night, for example, at seven o'clock with another science cafe. Next week, we're going to be talking with author Doug Emlin. He's also a biology professor, and he's going to be talking about animal weaponry. Don't miss that one. I think it's going to be really fun. That link, you can check out the museum's website, naturalsciences.org, or follow us on social media to get more information. Uh, also, hey, check out NCC Grant and the WRRI. Those folks are doing great stuff. They've got great websites with lots of resources, and you'll enjoy following them on social media as well. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again real soon. Bye. Good night, everyone.